In the desert hills of Thebes in Egypt, men are toiling in the dust, sifting for fragments from the past. But the harsh, laborious nature of their work is deceptive. It is all part of an urgent international operation, attempting to save one of the greatest artistic treasures in the world. And the role of these men is vital in searching for the minutest pieces of evidence of a woman's illustrious past. Here, they've unearthed a tiny piece of gold, part of a bracelet, perhaps. As far as we know, these are almost the only surviving personal possessions of a queen renowned throughout the ancient world 3,000 years ago. Close to Egypt's modern border with the Sudan stand the colossal rock-cut temples of Abu Simbel. They were built by the great pharaoh Ramesses II, who ruled during the most glittering period of Egyptian history, the New Kingdom, some 1,300 years before the birth of Christ. Ramesses was all-powerful and a god to his people. He is immortalized in temples and towering images the length of the Nile. But here at Abu Simbel, there is a personal touch to this austere facade. To his side, there stands a statue of his favorite queen. Nefertari, for whom the sun shines. yards to the east of Ramesses' own temple, he dedicated a second to Nefertari herself. No other queen in the history of Egypt was honored in this way, and no royal wife was ever represented on a scale that matched her king. Nefertari was unique, a legend. After her death in 1250 BC, she was to remain a legend, virtually lost to history. Until in 1904, a team of Italian archaeologists working 250 miles north of Abu Simbel, near the famous Valley of the Kings, stumbled upon a tomb. What they found were some of the greatest glories of Egyptian art. It was the burial place of Nefertari herself. The archaeologists were led by Ernesto Schiaparelli. He found that the tomb had been plundered in antiquity. Only the lid of her sarcophagus remained, and there was extensive damage to the walls. Nevertheless, he was overwhelmed by the magnificence of the images that surrounded him, and he made a photographic record of them all. Never before had he seen Egyptian paintings of such quality. Ciò non di meno in quella parte che è la maggiore nella quale le decorazioni rimanevano intatte. Where the decorations are intact and you can work out the arrangement, the size of the figures and the magnificence and sureness of style remind us of the best Egyptian art of the 19th dynasty. Nel primo periodo della diciannovesima dinastia fanno di questa tomba uno This is one of the most important monuments in the whole necropolis. It is small in scale but the artistic harmony, the exquisite painting, and the liveliness of the colors make it one of the finest tombs in the valley.
If the paintings are of extraordinary quality, their technique too is very unusual. In most tombs, the rock itself is painted, but here they're on a layer of plaster made from Nile mud. But this technique has created a terrible problem. Nefertari's tomb has been closed for 50 years, never seen by anyone other than specialists. This is the first time television cameras have been allowed here. Because the paintings have been deteriorating rapidly, and no one knew why. Large sections are peeling off the walls, whole areas of plaster have fallen away. There is a real possibility that these paintings may be lost forever. But in a race against time, a major rescue operation is underway. At the heart of that operation is a team of Italian art conservators. They come from a different world of conservation, accustomed to working on the Renaissance frescoes of Giotto and Mantegna. They have never tackled paintings 3,000 years old, nor have they ever set foot in Egypt before. led by Laura Mora and her husband Paolo, formerly head conservator at the Central Institute for Restoration in Rome. He directs the operation. Their day begins early each morning with the public ferry across the Nile from Luxor. As in antiquity, the only way to cross the river is by boat. In ancient Egypt, the pharaoh and his court lived on the east bank, and when they died, they were symbolically ferried to the other side. From the landing stage, Nefertari's tomb is about 10 minutes' drive through the villages and fields that lie between the Nile and the Valley of the Kings. Paolo Mora's team are hand-picked from amongst his former pupils. They're mostly art history graduates who have specialized with Mora in conservation. Mora himself, who is one of the world's leading conservators, trained as an architect. We are not scientists, we are not artists. But we should have the possibility to speak with scientists, with art historians, with archaeologists, with every other uh, branch of our work. Their journey takes them past the Colossi of Memnon, which guard the entrance to the huge necropolis of the ancient Egyptian capital. It's not easy to identify precisely what the restorer should be, but he should be. He should never be an artist, as I told you, but he has to know how to paint and how to draw, and well also. And he has, must have a sensibility, it's the right sensibility, has to a perfect eye for colors, and understand what the object he is working on means, and how it's made. The work is funded by the Getty Conservation Institute. The project director is a Mexican, Miguel Angel Corso. We began this Nefertari project by trying to determine precisely what our objectives were. Mainly to determine the causes of decay in the wall paintings of the tomb. It was this condition survey that led us to uh, undertake the emergency consolidation of the wall paintings. 
these specialists and scientists come from four continents. We have specialists from the United States and Mexico, from Spain, Germany, Italy, and Japan, together with the Egyptian scientists who have come to the rescue of this extraordinarily important world cultural monument. It is not an easy environment in which to work, airless and with temperatures that reach into the 90s. The team's first priority is to stabilize the tomb and prevent any further deterioration. Their initial major problem is the work of earlier restorers, which has often done more harm than good. One of our most difficult tasks is to take off what previous restorers added or worked on uh, paintings, on works of art. It's normally the most difficult work we have to face with. But one has to be very, very careful. They found that pieces of protective fabric applied to the surface of the plaster to keep it in place had been too rigid and too heavy. Far from saving the paintings, they were damaging them further. These are now being replaced with a much lighter mulberry bark paper, whose fibers have better absorbency and elasticity. No fewer than 10,000 pieces of this new paper will have to be specially cut and fixed in the emergency treatment. But in some places, the walls have been covered with sheets of stiff gauze glued to the paint surface. Stephen Rickaby from the Courtauld Institute in London is applying a solvent to break down the old adhesive. It's a very dangerous process. A single slip could spell disaster. I was just applying the, the solvent quite carefully and trying to soften the gauze, but taking care not to saturate too much the plaster beneath. You, you try to pull away a stubborn piece of gauze, but you're afraid that that's going to pull away the plaster as well. And it's uncovering a lot of problems underneath. When, when you're working on a painting, uh, like, the, like the Nefertari paintings, you don't have time to think about how old these paintings are, but yes, every now and then, you complete what you're doing, you, you fix back a flake and it's safe to, to breathe again. And you step back and I think 3,000 years old, you know. Allora Giorgio, che cosa pensavi di fare qua? Adesso sto usando il consolidante per far riaderire la scaglia di... More than 150 square meters of wall surface needs to be conserved. It will take at least five years since the scale of the task is matched by its technical problems. The tomb made always, to me, a very great impression. Uh, maybe the most uh, important impression was the condition of conservation. And we saw that it was a very difficult problem, a problem who could be solved not in an easy way, and not in a normal way, not in the way we are used to it because of difference of materials, difference of conditions, difference of, uh, of everything. In many parts of the tomb, plaster is falling away from the rock. Here, epoxy resin is injected between the two, and the plaster pushed gently back into place.
This, the ceiling of Nefertari's burial chamber, was once painted to imitate the night sky, spangled with stars. Mora is eager to encourage young conservators and train them in his methods. We have more layers in the rock, one layer of plaster, mm -hmm. second layer of plaster, and one whitewash with a cut on top. And we have sometimes detachment between the first layer. And with his experience, he can locate and, and diagnose hidden and damage and simply by sounding the wall. This is a detachment, first layer of plaster mm -hmm. from the second. Paint layer from the second layer. Whitewash from yes. the first layer of the both layers from the rock. Mora's assessment of the precise depth of the damage will determine where injections of resin have to be made. Tens of thousands of these injections will be needed to fill the smaller cracks and bond loose surfaces together. Egyptian conservators are working alongside their European counterparts. The exchange of different ideas and work experience is vital when they're faced with such a complex challenge. Many months before Moore and his team could start work, a special survey was carried out to try and determine the cause of the damage. Put the cracks here in the center. Ah, uh, yes, the cracks are wet pretty well. So it's uh, quite amazing that only in this area we have a lot of patch -up. It was certainly not the work of tomb robbers, and the survey ruled out the possibility of natural disasters like earthquake. Mm -hmm. But it did identify the immediate culprit of the damage, salt. The problem has been caused by water seeping through the limestone, forming salt crystals between the plaster and the rock, forcing the plaster to crack and the paint layer to flake. Here we have salts, crystals. Beautiful but dangerous. Here we have one. It was difficult to take it off. For its shape, we call it Manhattan. The home of the Getty Conservation Institute is Los Angeles, California. The Institute is an organization concerned with the preservation of art treasures throughout the world. It is here that much of the laboratory analysis is being carried out. Frank Preusser, Getty's scientific director, explains. One of the most destructive factors in the tomb is the crystallization of the salt pushing the plaster and paint layers off the walls. And within the international team of experts of various disciplines, we have undertaken a study of this phenomenon. And here I have samples of the salt that has been collected in the tomb. And Along with the salt, samples of rock plaster and the paint surface were placed inside an electron microprobe, the same type of machine used to analyze the first samples of rock brought back from the moon. The purpose of the test was to determine where exactly the salt crystals had formed in relation to the plaster and paint. We have studied the salt itself, and Don, could you bring up the plaster sample? And of the plaster, uh, in the plaster we found some crystalline substances. Could you enlarge it and focus on it? And 
to our astonishment, we did not find any salt in the plaster. So we continued and started the painted layers, again, sodium chloride. So in total, we found that the salt is only crystallizing between the rock and the plaster, between the plaster and the paint layer, and on top of the paint layer. We have discussed this phenomenon extensively with our colleagues and the various theories about how it came to this crystallization phenomenon. And in the beginning, we believe it was due to occasional rainfalls. Uh, however, a colleague from Egypt, Dr. Omar Larini, has postulated the theory that the damage is ancient, that the salt has been activated during the plastering and paint process when the tomb was built. And most of us are leaning now towards this theory. The Egyptian theory, then, is that the salt growth occurred in ancient times. Salt naturally present in the rock, drawn out by the application of too wet a plaster. There is evidence, too, of other tiny imperfections in antiquity. Too much paint, three millennia before the invention of non-drip. Hairs of a paintbrush carelessly left behind. And here, as he worked away, the painter left the telltale mark of his nails imprinted in the plaster before it had time to dry. One of the best yeah. scenes in the film, and more, one of the most best, best, best conditions. Yes. All the evidence so far suggests that it was simply Nefertari's bad luck that the site chosen for her tomb was a poor quality limestone seam laden with salt. The deeper you go, the density of the salt becomes greater. Here in the burial chamber, the salt damage is at its worst. Dr. Ahmed Kadri, chairman of the Egyptian Antiquities Organization for six years, is a frequent visitor. Previous attempts at restoration have involved detaching whole areas of plaster and remounting them on frames isolated from the rock. But Mora, in consultation with the Egyptian authorities, has ruled out this technique as too dangerous. And he also thinks it would destroy the character of the tomb. It's already clear that this will be a long and expensive project to restore paintings worthy of a royal queen. But what do we know of Nefertari, in whose honor this work is being done? Her status and renown among Egyptian queens was unparalleled. But the real story of Nefertari seems one of the romances of Egyptian history. That Nefertari should have a temple dedicated to her was doubly remarkable. For she was not of royal blood, and neither was she Ramesses' only wife. She was one of many. But she was here, in regal splendor, presiding over its dedication in 1255 BC. In the temple's reliefs, she is depicted paying homage to the gods, almost their equal. Nefertari was Ramesses' first wife. She was married to him at the age of 16 and bore him his first child. The formalities of Egyptian art betray little, but Nefertari, the chosen one above all women, stood highest in Ramesses' affections. 
It was she who appeared with him at all grand state occasions and religious festivals. Nefertari accompanied Ramesses throughout his realm as he embarked on a great program of building and expansion. He set up temples and monuments in all the major Egyptian cities. Here at Thebes, he restored and extended the magnificent temple of Luxor. The great pylon and court here at its northern end was his work. Nefertari would once have been enthroned here and acclaimed as Hemet Nesu Weret, great royal wife. As Ramesses' queen, she ruled with him over the greatest period of Egyptian civilization, a thousand years before the age of classical Greece. Ramesses gave peace and prosperity to Egypt for almost half a century. But his greatest achievement was to unify the country and defeat the Hittites at the Battle of Kadesh in 1285 BC. Scenes from this famous victory decorate the walls of his temples. Here too, Nefertari played her part. After the battle, she sent gifts of jewels and royal garments to the Hittite queen and a blessing. May the sun god of Egypt and the storm god of the Hittites bring you joy. Nefertari was clearly diplomat as well as queen. Nefertari died at the age of 45, before Ramesses. He had already prepared the tomb to receive his beloved wife. In its upper chamber, the deities who guarded Nefertari's earthly existence welcome her as stewards of her passage to the netherworld. The Egyptians saw the afterlife as in many ways an extension of the everyday world. Here, Nefertari plays a game called Senet, enjoyed by both the living and the dead. Kepri, god of the morning sun, represents rebirth and is symbolized by the sacred scarab. In this painting, Nefertari presents cloth to the god Ptah, patron of artists and craftsmen. His face is painted in green and black, the shades of the underworld. The ibis-headed Thoth is archivist and scribe to the gods. Nefertari presents him with writing equipment as an offering. In these hieroglyphs, Nefertari is proclaimed as great royal wife and lady of the two lands, as she was on earth. In her own cartouche, she is termed beloved of the goddess Mut, the mother god. And below, the text declares that through her works in life, she is fit to enter the netherworld of Osiris. Before departure, Nefertari adores the sacred bulls, who will sustain her on her journey. Below are rudders to guide her on her way. 
Nefertari was entombed here in the lower chamber with great pomp and ritual. Her sarcophagus set between four pillars on which the protective gods keep watch. Most of these wonderful paintings are treated in a typically stylized way. But the delicacy and sensitivity of Nefertari's many images suggest that in real life she was a lady of grace and great beauty. After six months, the program of emergency repairs in the tomb has been completed and the true work of conservation can begin. And not far from the tomb, in the old Thomas Cook Traveller's Rest House, an air-conditioned field laboratory has been set up, the first of its kind in Egypt. It will be the base for the project's work and a centre for on-site analysis and research. Here, too, students will be trained to carry on the work. The team are now prepared to start the long-term treatment. But how extensive and radical will the restoration be? Our aim is conservation rather than restoration or reconstruction. To save and preserve what can be saved for future generations maximum conservation and minimum of interventions. Now they know that the salt crystals are the problem, they first have to remove them. In many places it is easy to knock them off the rock by hand. But in parts of the tomb, there were such large concentrations of crystals beneath the plaster that whole sections were hanging free from the walls and threatening to collapse. The remedy they have developed is to cover the paintings with a thin gauze and then remove the plaster from the wall section by section. Bars of polystyrene are attached to keep the plaster rigid and give them something to hold on to. Following the path of hairline cracks, sections are cut away and carefully removed. It's a delicate process, fraught with danger. Polystyrene bars can later be taken off without damaging the paint. Loose debris and salt crystals are then chipped away from the rock. The sections of plaster that have been removed now have their interior surfaces cleaned and scored. When the pieces are put back on the wall, the cracks between them will be filled with original material. For 3,000 years, plaster debris has been accumulating in the burial chamber. Now it is collected, sieved and washed. It is then ground into a fine powder to be reconstituted as lime plaster and returned to the walls of the tomb.
The constitution of the mix has to be very precise. To the rubble dust is added a little gypsum and Arabic gum. There must be as little water as possible to minimize the risk of reactivating the salts. In the burial chamber, the edges of the suspended plaster are now treated and an acrylic emulsion injected to prime the surfaces. Plaster pillars are placed strategically. Pressure is applied by the use of small pads and the plaster is allowed to dry. It all seems rather primitive and unsophisticated, but it is very effective. The pressure pad may stay in place for two or three days. Finally, both the wall and the panel are packed with a small amount of plaster, and the painted section that has been cleaned is replaced. In many areas, the damage is so serious that the surface has to be treated quite differently. Larger holes are filled with stone chippings before being plastered. The finished plaster will be given a stippled or rough cast effect, clearly showing it is restoration. But in other places where the damage is not so serious, the surface is specially rendered in preparation to take fresh paint. Here, perhaps the most controversial aspect of the work is taking place. Although it has been agreed that there will be no full-scale repainting of the walls, for smaller sections, Mora has introduced a technique developed in Italian art conservation. They call it trateggio, from the Italian word tratto, a straight line. The objective is visual effect rather than repainting. Up to a dozen different colors are used. The paint is watercolor, which can easily be washed off if the technique is later considered to be inappropriate. Instead of painting in solid blocks of pure color, subtle combinations of different colors are applied beside each other in thin straight lines with the finest of brushes. Working on one of the famous portraits of Nefertari, Lorenza D'Alessandro explains her technique. Right now, I'm using black, green, and blue. And I start from this stage with very light color. And then, 
I arrived at this kind of value. I'm using a very thin brush and a support, so I can obtain a very precise vertical line. Lorenzo begins by painting a series of thin black lines. Then she will return and paint green lines between them. Finally, between these, she will infill with blue, creating an overall quality of color to match the original dense blue on the left. This is a test piece painted especially for the Egyptian authorities to see if they will approve the technique. Eventually, all the damaged areas in this painting will be treated in the same fashion. But already you can see the desired effect. Seen close to, even the most untutored eye can detect that the green here is not original. Step back a few paces and the tratteggio vanishes and produces a much easier and more rewarding reading of the composition of the original colors. The Egyptian authorities are very keen to open the tomb to the public. But before that can happen, there is one further critical problem that is concerning the experts the discoloration of many of the original painted surfaces. To try and unravel what chemical reaction is taking place, the Getty people went to an expert on the other side of the world. In Japan, at the University of Tokyo, is the Department of Conservation Sciences. It has an enormous reference collection of fungi obtained from historical monuments all over the world. Professor Hideo Arai has been a member of the Getty team from the outset. He is a biologist who specializes in the environmental analysis of ancient sites. On day one of the project, he entered the tomb alone in order to make a complete biological survey. He found evidence of moisture already there, but what was more serious, he discovered that in a period of three days, his own presence in the tomb caused the number of fungi and harmful bacteria to double. Could he also explain the discoloration in the paint? I discovered in Nefertari's tomb that the discoloration from blue to black in parts of the ceiling may be caused by microorganisms whose growth is encouraged by an increase in humidity. So we put a sample of plaster into an incubator and found that fungi began to grow. What we may have done is induced a living organism that has lain dormant since the time of the queen herself. If tombs like Nefertari are to be open to the public, then access has to be in a controlled environment, supported by the best scientific analysis. We hope to produce recommendations that will determine a correct and well-informed policy. To protect the beauties of Nefertari's tomb in the future, the numbers of visitors may well have to be restricted. But what is certain is that the immediate threat to the paintings has gone. As the team's work continues, every inch of the tomb is photographed. 
So far, an archive of 3,000 transparencies has been put together. Then don't move, but only your hand. Ready? It also documents each stage of the conservation work itself. The remarkable achievement here will undoubtedly prove a model for future projects. The conservation of the wall paintings in the tomb of Nefertari is not just a conservation challenge. The project was jointly chosen by the Egyptian Antiquities Organization and the Getty Conservation Institute because the decay problems that existed in that tomb are very representative of the problems that are affecting many other Egyptian tombs of the New Kingdom in that area. So it wasn't for us just to respond to a challenge, but rather to start a research project that will eventually lead to the successful treatment of this conservation problem in the tomb of Nefertari and then will be afterwards applicable to the salvage of all these other tombs in the Valley of the Kings. When uh, somebody will enter the tomb after our work, and we hope to finish it, I don't say very fast, but probably in two, three years, everybody should say, what did they do? Nobody went in, nobody has done a work. That's the best compliment for us.